And it is so under and it is so common though. No, I don't know. Oh. Thank you. 
Anila Kumari, you can start.
Shall we start? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Good morning, sir. Ah, good morning. Shall we start? Is Aldama here? Is Aldama here? Anila Kumari, yes, sir. You can start. Yeah. Uh, Anila, please do start. Please. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Is it audible? Yes. Yes. Okay. 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 Thank you, sir. Good morning, one and all. Now it is the time for the seventh technical session of the workshop. Uh, now we have a session on the methodology of behavioral economics. Uh, Dr. Vijay Monipalaisa, Honorary Fellow, Gifts Trevaram. And now it's my pleasure to welcome you all to the session. First of all, I welcome Dr. Anadavi, Professor and Head of the Department and the Organizing Secretary of Workshop, Dr. Manchu S. Nair, Dean, Faculty of Social Science, welcomes her fully, dear ma'am, to the session. I welcome the entire faculty members who were the supporting hands in the organizing workshop, the research scholars, students, and other participants from various other institutions. Good morning, everyone and all. Uh, then, now, uh, we have a wonderful session on uh, the methodology of behavioral economics, uh, Dr. Vijay Mohan Bale, sir. Uh, then, uh, sir, is not a few uh, new faiths for us. He is known to all of us and here is with us throughout the entire workshop sessions with the presentations, valuable suggestions, and as a research support to the colloquium sessions uh, for the researchers, uh, new faculty members who are um, uh, here to eager, eagerly okay. here to view his uh, points and others. Then really, we are blessed with an eminent researcher, a stage setter, the end researcher. No words to say on his contribution to the field of research than uh, as, uh, as an academician. And as a faculty member, as a renowned person in this economic field, sir, from the bottom of my heart, with a great pleasure, I welcome you to the session for the uh, wonderful presentation on the methodology of behavioral economics. Okay, thank you. I have a PowerPoint, I shall share the screen. So you can see the screen, right? Anybody? Can you see the okay, screen? Okay, sir, okay, sir. Can you see the screen? Can you see? Yes, sir. Yes, yes sir. Okay. okay. So this is in continuation of the yesterday's uh, presentation on experimental economics because behavioral economics is full of experiments, not just experiments, but Many of the branches of behavioral economics are concerned with experiments, especially in the game theoretic framework. I will not go into, into the game theory, all those experiments, but I will just give some basic ideas on behavioral economics and its methodologies, especially in terms of the prospect theory and 
what has become famous after the Nobel Prize as Nadji. So these two cases I will take up. I will not take much time as I took yesterday. <laughs> so, of course, I am starting with uh, some uh, history or behavior economics. So, this particular term, behavioral economics, was in use as early as 1958, according to Johnson and Boldy. The, in fact, the, histori the historical roots of this economics branch can be traced to cognitive psychology. I will tell you something about this cognition later. Actually, the modifier for the economics, that is the term behavior, comes from the behavioral decision research. Even though this modifier, this particular term, is being criticized for being redundant, because economics is usually considered somewhat behavioral. Economics is considered a behavioral science. Since the mid-1980s, a research foundation, a Russell Sage Foundation, has been helping funding the behavioral economics. And this foundation has been instrumental in the establishment of behavioral economics as an independent sub-discipline. Weiner is a famous behavioral economist. According to him, the field is misnamed. It should have been called cognitive economics. And one says that during the time when he was working in the Russell Sage Foundation, they weren't brave enough to call it cognitive economics. Now I will give a little history about, about the development of behavioral economics. I will start with the classical period. We know microeconomics was during the classical period of economics was closely linked to psychology. For example, Arthur Smith wrote the theory of moral sentiments that proposed psychological explanations of individual behavior, including concerns about fairness and justice. Jeremy Bentham, the utilitarian, wrote extensively on the psychological underpinnings of utility. During the development of neoclassical economics, the marginalist revolution, economists sought to reshape the discipline as a natural science. Yesterday, we saw this using deduction. Using deduction to find out behavior from assumptions about the nature of economic agents. They developed the concept of homo economics. That is the economic man whose behavior was assumed to be fundamentally rational. So that is how the rationality concept appeared in the neoclassical economics. Neoclassical economists did incorporate psychological explanations. This was true of Edgeworth, Pareto, and Fisher. Neoclassical economics, based on the rational choice paradigm, 
postulates that people in general are rational. That is, they are consistent in their choice. That is why we have that 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 rationality theorem or the or what is called the transitivity theorem in economics. We you know if somebody chooses A or, or somebody prefers A to B and B to C, then he must choose A to C. That is the transitivity theorem. If he chooses something else, then he is not rational. If he chooses, if he prefers A to B and B to C, then he must, as a rational being, he must prefer A to C. So that is rationality. So a rational decision maker should always prefer better things to worse things. More money to less and acts to maximize her self-interest or expected utility using available full information appropriately. So behind rationality, there is making use of the full information also. And that is why we say that, that the rationality, rational, we, we characterize rationality as optimization. That is, in decision making, which is a fully rational process of finding an optimal choice, given the information available, we are finding the rationality in decision making. This idealized economic agent is the Homo economicus, in contrast to our own species, Homo sapiens. So behind the concept of Homo economicus, we have the concept, the necessary concept of rationality. And also rationality as optimization. Classical and early neoclassical economists made frequent reference to cognitive and affective states, as I told you earlier. There are actually three states of mind. The cognitive part of the brain has to do with intelligence. The next one is the affective part. It deals with the emotions. And the third part is the cognitive part. It derives how one acts on those thoughts and feelings. So these are the three states of mind the cognitive part, the affective part, and the cognitive part. Cognitive part deals with the intelligence part, and affective part deals with the emotions. And the cognitive will combine these thoughts and feelings. The, the, the conception of human nature of the classical and the early neoclassical economies and therefore the human decision making often was relatively sophisticated and in many cases it was inspired by developments in psychology. Early neoclassical economies such as Yavons, Karl Menger, and Leon Walra. The, these three were the originators of neoclassical economies. They are called the marginalist revolutionaries. Neoclassical economics came with what is called the marginalist, marginalist revolution in economics. They are called the marginalist because they have immensely utilized the, the differential calculus in economics. The first use of differential calculus in economics came with these people. That is why they are called the marginalist economists. They explicitly grounded economics in hedonic psychology. That is, according to them, 
individuals seek to maximize pleasure and minimize pain in yogon's ways pleasure and pain are undoubtedly the ultimate objects of the calculus of economics see they are missing the mathematical thing calculus to satisfy our wants to the utmost with the least effort in other words to maximize pressure is the problem of economics that is why the rationality their, their rationality concept is characterized as rationality as optimization because maximizing pressure that that based on the hedonic psychology is the basis of neoclassical economics economic psychology emerged in the 20th century in the works of tade katona and garai it came with the, the expected utility hypothesis and discounted utility models and these models began to gain acceptance generating a stable hypothesis about decision making given uncertainty in in respect of the expected utility hypothesis and intertemporal consumption in respect of the discounted utility models however observed and repeatable anomalies eventually challenge this hypothesis and as we saw yesterday the final blow came from morris alle in 1953 in terms of what is called the famous alley paradox which is a decision problem that contradicts the expected utility hypothesis i told you about this yesterday now the behavioral science or economics appears as early as 1943 for example clark hall from yale university spoke about 1943 that the behavioral or social sciences in his principles of behavior the term became widely used only after james miller created the committee on the behavioral sciences at the psychology department of the university of chicago in 1949 and the ford foundation's behavioral science program was created in 1951 expected utility theory as a criterion for rational decision making was axiomatically derived by us we saw yesterday for Newman and Morgenstern in 1944 this was the benchmark theory of individual decision making but as we have already seen morris alle who was awarded nobel prize in 1988 came in 1953 challenging this particular individual decision making process informing us that in some situations actual behavior can differ systematically from the predictions of expected utility theory then as we saw earlier simon who was awarded nobel prize in 1978 integrated the insights of the effects of limited cognition in psychology and he developed the concept of bounded rationality so this days we do, we we do not believe in perfect rationality but human beings are credited only with bounded rationality that is limited rationality The use of behavioral economics was initially popularized at the University of Michigan's Institute of Social Research in the late 1940s by George Katona. Ward Edwards, also at the University of Michigan, 
starting in the late 1950s, employed his branch of operations research called behavioral decision research. In the 1960s, cognitive psychology began to shed more light on the brain as an information processing device in contrast to the behaviorist models. Psychologists in this field, such as Ward Edwards, those Amos Tosky and Daniel Kahneman, began this the, the last two people we will we will talk about later maybe. They began to compare their cognitive models of decision making under risk and uncertainty to economic models of rational behavior. And behavioral economics was finally appropriated, so it is said, appropriated by Daniel Kahneman, Richard Taylor, and Eric Weiner in the newly created behavioral economics program at the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation in 1984. That's the genesis of behavioral economics. So the the theme is directly related to Kahneman, Taylor, and Wyatt. And Kahneman, he was an Israeli American psychologist, was awarded the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economics in 2002 for having integrated. Integrate, having integrated insights from psychological research into economic science, especially concerning human judgment and decision making under uncertainty. And similarly, Richard Taylor got the Nobel Prize in 2017 for incorporating psychologically realistic assumptions into analysis of economic decision making by exploring the consequences of limited rationality that is the bounded rationality social preferences and lack of self-control he has shown how these human traits systematically affect individual decisions as well as market conditions market outcomes Then Richard Taylor, he has a number of publications. He once brought together a group of students in an undergraduate psychology class at Cornell University to, to, to take part in what is now recognized as a landmark experiment. So he told the class this. I will give each of you an endowment of dollar twenty that you have to share with an anonymous classmate. Remember, anonymous classmate. You have a choice: either split the endowment equally with the anonymous partner, that is, be a fair one, be fair, or keep dollar eighteen while giving the other student only dollar two, that is. Be, be an unfair partner. So this is the experiment. Based on the Homo economicus principle, standard economics predicts a rational student would choose the second option to maximize his own payoff. What is the second option? That is, be unfair. Being unfair means he will get dollar eighty, and he needs to give only dollar two to the anonymous. Remember anonymous because that anon that partner anonymous partner would not declare that he has got only dollar two. So a homo economicus, that is a an economic man, being a rational will choose this one only because he is maximizing his payoff. 
with the 18 dot and this is because the because the anonymity ensures no threat of reputation nobody is going to know that he has given only dollar 2 instead of dollar 10 and he has kept 18 dollars with him nobody is going to know that so he will be safe to do that as a rational being but what was the result of the experiment a majority of the students that is 122 out of the 161 who took part in the experiment chose to share the money equally and giving a blow to the concept of homo economicus. And actually this, 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 this was a, this comes from the famous dictator game. This is a sort of dictator game. I will tell you about the dictator game after Saturday. So this dictator game is a popular experimental instrument in psychology and economics. The game, game is actually a misnomer because there is only a single player to make decision. It is a derivative of the ultimate game. So the dictator games, game comes from what is called the ultimate game. And uh, what is this ultimatum game? This is a popular inst instrument of economic experiments. And this was first described by Werner Booth, Schmidtberger, and Schwarz in 1982. There are two players, a proposer and a responder. The proposer is endowed with a sum of money, the way we have seen earlier. The teacher has given dollar twenty to the student, and the student is the proposer. And then the anonymous partner is the respondent. Now the proposer is endowed with a sum of money. He is to split it with the responder. The proposer has two options: a fair split or an unfair split. You know this because I have already explained it. Once the proposer communicates his decision, the responder may accept it or reject it. If the responder accepts, the money is split as per the proposal. If the responder rejects, then both the players receive nothing. So keep these tips, okay? Now I shall show you a representation of this ultimate game. See, this is player one and this is player two. This is the proposer and this is the responder. The, the proposer has two options, being fair or unfair. Okay, if he is fair, then the, the responder, that is player two, has two options, either to accept it, accept the offer or reject the offer. If in this case, player two, the responder accepts, then both the players will get a payoff of $5 each, five five. If player two, the responder rejects, then both of them will get nothing, zero, zero. On the other hand, the unfair deal, okay? That is the proposal selects being unfair. Here also, the second player has two options, accept or reject. If he, if he accepts, then the player one, the proposal will get H, and the player two, the responder will get two dollars. If he rejects, both of them will get nothing. 
So this is a, an example of an ultimate game. And this is said to be the extensive form representation of a two proposal ultimatum game. So this I have already explained, right? Player one can be either fair or unfair. unfair. And the player two, that is the responder, can either accept or reject. In the dictator game, the first player, he is the dictator. The proposal is the dictator. That is why this game is called the dictator game. He determines how to split an endowment between himself and the second player. The responder, the recipient, has no influence over the outcome of the game. The results of this dictator game shows human beings are more benevolent than homo economicus. That is, people value fairness in their economic lives. They are not so selfish as ingrained in the concept of homo economicus. Results from this and other similar experiments were published by Kahneman, Nash, and Taylor as an article, Fairness and the Assumptions of Economics in the Journal of Business. The dictator game shows human beings value fairness in their economic interactions. Taylor has also thrown fresh light on our limited rationality, bounded rationality, our inability to stick to goals because of the lack of self-discipline and the trouble we have in discounting the future. His doctoral work on the statistical valuation of human life, titled The Value of Saving a Life, a Market Estimate, has survived the initial skepticism of his thesis advisor. So I need not explain this further, right? The, actually, the thesis advisor is the thesis supervisor or the guide. The guide, the supervisor, was not at all in favor of passing this his doctoral work initially. But anyhow, he had to do that, and uh, it was for the for the best of uh, but the, the doctoral work. Now the psychologist Kahneman and Tversky in 1979 proposed what is called the prospect theory that aims to describe the actual behavior of individuals when making decisions under risk, which may not necessarily be rational or optimal. Their theory was motivated by a number of findings on how people systematically violate the predictions of expected utility theory. Tversky and Kahneman in 1992 provided an important extension of the prospect theory called cumulative prospect theory. I will give some idea about this prospect theory later. There are four main elements for this theory. First, Individuals derive utility not from wealth or consumption levels, but rather from gains and losses relating to some reference points. The second main element is individuals are more sensitive to losses than to gains. That is, they exhibit loss aversion. They tend to give greater weight to potential losses than to potential gains. 
They are giving an example. In an experimental setting where people start out with dollar fifty and are then offered the choice of either keeping dollar twenty or taking a gamble with a one third chance of keeping all dollar fifty and a two third chance of keeping nothing. In this experimental setting, most choose to keep the dollar twenty. If instead the choice is framed as losing dollar thirty or a gamble with a one third chance of keeping all dollar fifty and a two third of losing it all, most of the participants choose the gamble, and that is why they postulated the second element, that is individuals are more sensitive to losses. Than to gains. While these two scenarios are materially identical, simply changing the wording from keep to lose or gain to lose causes a significant proportion of people to change their behavior. The third element is that individuals exhibit diminishing sensitivity to gains and losses. That is, moving from a dollar hundred to a dollar two hundred, the the risk is hundred dollars. Okay, so moving from a dollar hundred to a dollar two hundred gain or loss has a larger Utility impact than moving from a dollar ten thousand one hundred to a dollar ten thousand two hundred gain or loss. In both the cases, we have the same margin, dollar hundred, but there is diminishing sensitivity to gains and losses. The fourth. Element is the theory incorporates probability weighting. That is, individuals weigh outcomes by subjective transform probabilities or decision weights. That is, overweighting low probabilities and underweighting high probabilities. Taylor. Was the first economist to apply prospect theory in 1980 to economic issues and problems. Kahneman and Tversky in 1979 had focused on risky decisions. Taylor showed in 1980 the importance of reference points and loss aversion in deterministic settings. While working on his PhD thesis at the University of Rochester, which he defended in 1974, Taylor started experimenting with the hypothetical survey questions to estimate the value of mortality risk reductions. Two survey questions from his 1980 paper we have. These are the two questions. First, assume you have been exposed to a disease, which, if contracted, leads to a quick and painless death within a week. The probability you have the disease is 0.001. The question is, what is the maximum you would be willing to pay for a cure? The second question. Is this suppose volunteers would be needed for research on the above disease? All that would be required is that you expose yourself to a point zero zero one chance of contracting the disease. What is the minimum you would require to volunteer for this program? 
you would not be allowed to purchase it. So these are the two states. Both the questions involve the evaluation of a 0 0.001 probability of death. However, as Taylor describes the results in 1980, many people respond to questions A and B with the answers which differ by an order of magnitude or more. A typical response is $200 to A and $10,000 to B. That is, people seem much less willing to pay for acquiring health compared to how much they require as compensation to sell health. Taylor in that article discusses several other scenarios where the price at which a person is willing to buy a certain good or service is considerably lower than the price at which the person would be willing to spend the same good or service. Neoclassical economic theory can hardly explain such a large difference between the willingness to pay and the willingness to accept. But Taylor found an explanation in prospect theory. He noted, if giving up an object is pursued as a loss, then loss aware individuals will behave as if the objects they own are more highly valued than similar objects they do not own. This, of, this effect Taylor named as the endowment effect. And according to him, this can explain the large differences between willingness to pay and willingness to accept. Now we shall come to the nudge theory. Nudge is a concept in behavioral science, political theory, and economics, which proposes positive reinforcement and indirect suggestions as ways to influence the behavior and decision-making of groups or individuals. So the, you know the dictionary meaning of nudge as indirect suggestion or a positive reinforcement. Nudging contrasts with the other ways to achieve, achieve compliance such as education, legislation, or enforcement. This, this is a nudge, is an indirect suggestion only. Not, no enforcement is there, no legislation, no education, only an indirect suggestion. The concept was popularized in the 2008 book by the behavioral economist Richard Taylor and the legal scholar Carl Sunstein at the University of Chicago. The, this is a famous book, Nudge, Improving Decisions About Health, Wealth, and Happiness. Actually, that book has become one of the best sellers. They refer to the influencing of behavior without coercion, without, for, without force, as libertarian paternalism, and the influences as choice archetypes. So in their definition, they use the term choice archetypes. A nudge, as we will use the term, is any aspect of the choice architecture that alters people's behavior in a predictable way without forbidding any options for significantly changing their economic incentives. To count as a mere nudge, the intervention must be easy and cheap to avoid. Nudges are not mandates. 
putting fruit at eye level counts as a nut but banning junk food does not count as a nut because there is force in banning junk, junk food we will come to that example again okay see here nudging techniques aim to capitalize on the judgmental heuristics of people that is a nudge alters the environment so that when heuristic decision making is used the resulting choice will be the most positive or desired outcome an example of such nudge is switching the placement of junk food in a store so that fruits and other healthy options are located next to the cash register or in the words of the behavioral economist at the eye level while junk food is relocated to another part of the store so this i have taken from this article nudging healthy food choices a field experiment at the train station there are some notable applications of nudge theory for example the formation of the british behavioral insights team insights team called the nudge unit in 2010 now both the prime minister david cameron of uk and the us president barack obama so to employ nudge theory to advance domestic policy goals during their terms and in australia the government of new south wales established a behavioral insights community of practice but at the same time a large number of critics have also been there for example bosman and welch how in point whether nothing should be permissible on grounds of distributive justice so see there are little debates to not or not to not the journal of political philosophy similarly lepenis and maleka how questions whether nudges are compatible with the rule of law and a large number of legal scholars have also come forward to discuss the role of nudges and the law then among the behavioral economists themselves there were critics of the nudge nudge theory such as bob sagen they have pointed out that the underlying normative benchmark of nudging is still homo economicus despite the proponents claim to the contrary so you can read this article do people really want to be nudged towards healthy lifestyles it has also been remarked that nothing is also a euphemism for psychological manipulation as practiced in social engineering see the article nudging and choice architecture ethical considerations also a nudge in the right direction how we can harness behavior effects and this is most of these are these articles are available Uh, online on the other hand the behavioral economist sanstein has responded to all these critics at length in his book the ethics of influence making the case in favor of nudging against the charges that not just diminish autonomy that is freedom <laughs> Threaten dignity, ah, violate liberties, or reduce welfare. Now, I will just give 
a comparison between the conventional economics and behavior economics conventional economics assumes that all people are both rational and selfish to maximize their own self interest in practice we know this is often not the case and the, as we have already seen the the ultimatum games have also proved that and uh, this leads to the failure of the traditional models behavioral economics on the other hand studies the biases tendencies and heuristics that affect the decisions that people make to improve tweak or overhaul the traditional economic theory it aims in determining whether people make good or bad choices and whether there could be help to make better choices it can be applied both before and after a decision is made and with this i am stopping here so if you have any doubts you can ask me yesterday i took a lot of time that is why i today thought of limiting the slides the number of slides so you have any questions <coughs> anybody yes sir hello yes sir yeah please any doubts or any comments sir i have a doubt um uh, can financial instruments act as uh, not just Um, okay. For example, can financial instruments uh, ah. act as nudges? For example, sir, in the case of uh, climate finance, uh, if we uh, turn to ESG funds or uh, those funds which are more uh, responsible in terms of their investments, like uh, with a more focus on not just bottom line but also the environmental, as far as social and financial instruments, do uh, such bonds ah, act as positive reinforcements that is indirect suggestions only okay. then they can be considered as nudges otherwise not if there is any force any imposition even any 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 education that is imparting some knowledge then it is not possible okay sir is that answer enough okay, actually in beha behavioral economics we have a branch for behavioral finance yes sir similar to behavioral behavioral game theory and so on strategic behavior that is the game theory approach we have behavioral finance also actually i thought of including all these branches also but i was afraid of uh, limiting the time because I, uh, I i i i wanted to finish this before one o'clock okay. uh, that is why uh, i but anyway the, all this will all this i will incorporate i have already the materials everything but the, for the present one i have in done that i will i will be uploading this in my research gate page uh, then you were you were about to 
tell us something what is that come on sir can a regulatory uh, changes or regulatory incentives like no um, no no because the term regulation itself includes okay. a force coercion coercion yeah. so it cannot nudge nudging means we are just uh, indirectly pushing indirect it is an indirect push we are not even touching usually the uh, when we say we are pushing something there is a force involved right here there is no force at all this is an indirect pushing okay so sir, uh, sir uh, sir just a clarification uh, when it when it comes to the stock markets and um, if some stocks which are more responsible if some uh, some companies are more responsible in terms of their investments and if uh, uh, shareholders or if we uh, general investors uh, start flocking to those stocks uh, will it act as an indirect nudge or can we analyze it from that perspective uh, the, you you mean uh, some or some uh, stocks sir i mean yes sir i mean yeah and uh, they invest some preference people are blocking it or Uh, or or sir, they are, they are, the the second part actually I didn't hear correctly. The first one I would rising. The corporations are behaving responsibly, right? Sir, suppose some companies uh, are more uh, responsibly suppose, investing their funds, yeah, uh, right. and yeah. if and if some uh, and if investors In as a case, class start uh, start to. Uh, prefer such companies ah, okay. or such okay. funds okay. Yeah. then uh, will it act as an indirect nudge for these companies to tow the line of uh, a more responsible investments of course it can of course it can in behavioral finance theory that part is there it can act so the so it is an implication from the investors right it is yeah. a, it is it is a passive pushing by the investors for okay. the for the companies to do the same line so they will do they will do that that is they will become more responsible that's the nudge right yeah right sir thank you so anybody sir, uh, i have a question ah Uh, uh, sir, uh, in 2015, hmm. a government has launched a program called Beti Bachao Beti Padhao Movement. Hmm. So it was said that in that uh, movement, it was uh, launched along with Swachh Bharat Mission. Hmm. So in that program, it was said that not just used. Hmm. And uh, f- uh, in case of Beti Bachao Beti Padhao Movement, hmm. the term failure bias was used. Uh, uh, For and for that failure bias, nudge was used. What 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 so is it? For failure. Fail failure bias as a cognitive bias. Ah uh, ah. Uh, failure okay. bias was taken, uh, and nudge was used to uh, get rid of that failure bias. Uh, Could you please explain how nudge is used to ex uh remove failure bias? That is in ah uh, okay. See. uh how can we how can we uh make uh children study initially we should have the constant investment and that is we should have the environment that is we should have a school making a school available okay is a sort of nudge because the the presence of a school will indirectly push the parents to send their wards to the schools because there is there is along with this there is also a, 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 a an imitation drive right that is what the neighbors do so they may they may they may have seen that the neighbors are sending their 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 children to school so that that particular effect okay that that okay. that particular effect also will couple along with this so nudging is coming from the presence of the school and that is why that is why the government government was very eager to establish 
schools wherever it was not available in 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 all the schools and not only that some incentives some incentives in 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 terms of uh, uh, say the the mid me midday meal or or giving free books and other things uniforms then free travel to the school all these are, are also provided all these will act indirectly these are the, the, the government is not imposing all these on the children but the presence of all these freebies freebies okay will will incentivize the parents also the children to go to the school and they once they are in school of course the 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 failure rate can go down right yes so it is the presence of the presence of that investment presence of the 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 school that makes a lot of difference and that is why we say the the school the the establishment of a school as both an instrumental instrumental utility only the instrumental utility because it is there its presence is enough so that people will students will go there and from there somebody some, the people the students the people can have the intrinsic value obtained so the schools have both instrumental and intrinsic value so the presence of a school can act as an edge so so is it clear hello yes sir yes okay okay thank you hello so somebody somebody is keeping the mic open okay now anybody anybody else hello sir ah come so audible no i no just stay louder hello sir i i will post in the comment box okay no no i cannot hear what is it hello speak a little louder can you hear me Yes, sir. It is in the ah. chat box. Ah, okay. What? Uh. Okay, okay, okay. Continue. So, anybody else? Sir, am I audible? Oh, yes. okay sir 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 actually i am doing research on the topic uh, road traffic injuries is based on uh, some behavioral aspects uh, so what is it no 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 just uh, what is it my exact topic is road traffic injuries and human oh, capital ah, loss and inquiry based no, 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 on let let the uh, road traffic injuries road yeah road traffic injuries and human capital loss ah uh, and inquiry based on behavioral aspects good. behavioral approach ah uh, sir uh, can you suggest me some practical methodologies for finding the behavior uh, aspects of uh, road users you cannot do any ex behavioral experiments right <laughs> what you can well, do sir? you cannot do any behavioral experiments but of course you can also uh -huh. do some experiments if you yeah, if you give some incentives to the participants remember okay, okay. yesterday i told you yesterday i told you that the uh, experimental economics largely makes use of incentives okay some payment, okay, sir. some payment must be there so the you can you can invite certain uh, uh, road users for the the bike rides or car drives and the rides okay. and to uh, do do you have to formulate some uh, some sort of an experiment so that you can you can you can find out their behavior but i don't and now uh, i don't i don't know what to 
how you can do that maybe up uh, you anyway anyway there might be some experiments done on this part this aspect also you go through the literature and find out how it can be done and think about it i shall also think okay sir thank you thank you very much and the and the, and at the same time you will also get a lot of data from the the one for the the one on road accidents and you, using that also you can you can find out the trench and pattern of road accidents etc okay but about testing the behavior that you have you may you, you may have to do some some experiments or what you can do is even even if you are going for a, a direct survey okay that is a primary survey of course you, you will have to do that also primary survey and to ask their ask their perspectives and the perceptions on an average you may get some some idea about it but at the same time if you can somehow design an experiment that will be better so both both the experiment and the uh, and the direct survey will give you a lot of information okay okay sir so thank you you have just started or you are already in the midst of it how long you have been pursuing this just started yes sir i have just started it and okay. i just i am preparing my questionnaire that's why i am asking oh i see i see okay okay yes i will definitely include this sir okay okay thank you thank you very much so anybody sir i have a question ah. sir can the impact of an just be measured like uh, when we uh, consider the cases uh, where we can uh, call the examples of national schemes or programs or even advertisements uh, for a common objective like beti uh, bajao can uh, this uh, if uh, we say that this uh, can we say that this uh, if a good impact has been reflected then it it's due, uh, duly because of the nudges or uh, or this programs or schemes can the impact of nudges measured of course using the using the interview method we can collect information right that is the the questionnaire method we can we can ask whether they are aware of this particular scheme and whether it is because of this scheme that they have sent their what's their children to the school so the, the it, it 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 depends upon framing your own questions so uh, that is actually that is the flexibility of uh, uh the, this direct questionnaire method sample survey method if you have a particular objective in your mind you can ask questions related to that so the, this nudging also in in respect of this particular central government program you can ask you can frame similar questions questions according to this particular case and ask the respondents it is possible and once you have got the answers whether they are aware of this program and that is why they have sent their watch to the schools and that will help you measure or or or, or formulate some scale or measure of this energy it is possible okay okay sir thank you. so anybody anybody else i think we may conclude yeah okay thank you sir we have experienced one more classic presentation the participants are excited and grateful to you for the wonderful session uh, thank you once again also i extend thanks to each participants and the teachers for being here uh, here with us for the last 3 days 
and uh, especially i extend a sincere thanks to uh, munidat the mphil scholar for the whole technical support thank you once again thank you thank you anida thanks to other faculty members in the uh, department also uh, uh, for inviting me to this uh, this conference seminar it, it was it was nice to uh, teach online like this thanks a lot thank you so we will be meeting in the we meeting afternoon for for the it, it starts by two o'clock right how many students? two yes, yes, sir. two o'clock two o'clock okay how many students are there uh, i think there are only four Four students. Four. Okay. Okay. We, we have got a lot of time then. Yes. Yes. Okay. okay. See you by two o'clock. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.